Um, this session is uh, giving you an update on a piece of work we've been doing with Greenhouse over the last couple of years. And it started by looking at the one million climate jobs pamphlets produced by the trade union movements and the campaign against climate change and asked the question, OK, well, that's a pamphlet um, used as a campaigning tool by the trade unions. Um, but we've had the government, the Conservatives, in for quite a long time. And it doesn't feel there's much appetite for, for listening or looking at what's in that pamphlet. So what if we turn that into a, uh, a piece of work which focused on, on local areas? How many jobs would actually that mean in a certain place? What would that actually require us to do? So this, this presentation is going through that. Um, then uh, we're going to look at some of the, the results for the local areas and have a discussion around that. So... The aim of this session is really to give you confidence to, to think and talk about jobs as a, a way of thinking about economic uh, scale of investment needed to deal with climate change locally. So that, yes, we understand the carbon, yes, we know the energy numbers, but can we talk the language of jobs and money so we can get the right kind of numbers written into a local plan, written into plans at a regional level, at a county level and so on, to start to influence what actually happens. So this is our challenge. We've known for a long time we need to plan to meet the climate and biodiversity challenge, but now people are making plans up and down the country. Councils have passed motions now in over half the UK authorities. But the challenge is to make sure this isn't a damp squib. This isn't, you know, climate strike, um, Greta Thunberg, um, massive media raising... And, and then we write a plan, we pass it through, and we haven't really thought, thought through what really needs to happen. So Tim Jackson, in the last month or so, he's published a, an academic report called Zero Carbon Sooner. He makes the case that we need to uh, reach zero carbon in the UK by between 2025 and 2030, depending on whether we have a linear or a more of a, an exponential reduction in carbon targets. So, you know... The scale of the challenge from the climate scientists is very clear. The scale of what we need to do in response to that is less clear. I mean, again, you know, we can look at the scale of the issues and problems which will happen if we don't deal with climate change. But have we really thought through in as much time and effort, not just the, the general terms of you know, what a zero-carbon Britain would look like, but maybe what a zero-carbon Hackney or a zero-carbon Suffolk might look like. Um, Nadine talked earlier on about the, the climate psychology of this. Now, if, if we are really serious about it, hopefully we've gone from climate denier, denial to be you know, really frustrated and angry that stuff isn't happening. So then, then maybe we're, we're bargaining with our, our other, other councillors on the council to try, try and get some agreement. And then maybe when there isn't much agreement, we end up being quite depressed... Uh, but we're in a situation now where people are accepting across whole council areas that we must do something. So in that place of acceptance, having gone through the, the anger of being ignored for so long and having gone through the bargaining process to get motions passed and then little action taken place, we, we can now work together to really move things forward. But the reality is what we're up against isn't just a few councillors of different parties or a government of one political persuasion or another, but a whole economic system that's designed around using more fossil fuels. Um, a car, I think, is the archetypal vehicle uh, that describes what that looks like. It's designed to be made out of oil. It runs on a surface which is produced by leftover oil, and it burns oil. So it uses every different part of the, uh, of, of the fractions of the oil and gas that's extracted from the ground in its life cycle, um, and it, it epitomises our consumer economy. And, and fundamentally, that's what we're up, up against challenging. We're, we're not just up against passing a few motions and policies in different areas to make our local area feel nice within the one kilometre zone between home and school, while you know, freight transport shuttles between these zero-carbon villages and flights and ships bring our consumer goods from China to our nice little zero-carbon communities. We need to challenge the whole system which lies behind the local areas. 
rather than what happens in the local areas themselves. So that's the same thing maybe expressed in consumer language. That's, that's the, maybe the behaviour change at the other end. So from behaviour change to economic system, how do we change things? Well, thankfully, things are changing. Um, this is a graph which shows um, the actual level of um, car traffic growth in the UK against successive government projections at different times. Currently, the Department of Transport only invests in local transport improvements where there is an increase in transport capacity. They don't invest where it is through modal shift or demand reduction. So the actual behaviour change of people is in spite of the investment in new roads rather than because of the investment in new roads. So with this kind of reality, I think there is the possibility of turning points. Um, and and, and the, uh, the, but on the other hand, this is the sort of trap. The, the idea that somehow climate change equals wind turbines, equals solar panels. Put the wind turbines and solar panels. Maybe we should have a connection here, not just to an SUV, but actually to an aeroplane. But that would have been looked even more ridiculous. But somehow we carry on doing exactly everything we do the same. And all we have to do is change our energy supply. But clearly we don't have enough space to put all of these wind turbines, and a technocentric approach is not going to deal with that overall problem we've got, which is the problem of fossil fuel use embedded in an economic growth model and behaviour change linked to that for us ever to want to consume more and to throw stuff away. So one million climate jobs, that was our starting point. What does that look across the whole of the UK, breaking down by local authority to local authority? Um, and how can we present that message in a way um, which, which links to the politics of today? I mean, this is an old slide. Um, thankfully, um, Greta Thornberg, Thornberg, I never pronounce her name properly. Um, exactly, it's, it's Swedish, and I, my Swedish isn't so good even to pronounce a surname in Swedish. You know, this argument I think we've got over now. People are accepting this is the right, the right way to go. Um, and it has benefits, rather than the benefits justify the actions, even for those people who de deny climate change. So we are moving on, but now we need to write the plans that write the climate change and all of these things together. So we need to shift our economic system. And, and the pitch here is, at a local level, we need to link the challenge of climate science to how we do planning and how we do economics locally. The reality is, is government is the place where you know, incentives uh, and, and regulations are set for, for things at a national level, but actual investment decisions of where things happen on the ground are planned. And we need to change the plans if we want to change what happens. So what sort of plans do we need? Currently, the government tends to focus on plans where it wants to control things. So it plans to spend vast amounts of money locked up into relatively small amounts, numbers of relatively big infrastructure investments. A motorway, a airport, a offshore wind turbine. But what if the solution to climate change was, was a local solution rather than a top-down solution? What if the investment was needed in, in you know, a repair cafe or a community farm or a a place to collect and reuse and redistribute the surplus bricks every time a house was built. That scale of investment is not really about um, big top-down stuff. It's about local bottom-up investment. And quite often that investment is not heavily capital intensive. It's not investment in concrete or tarmac or steel. It's investment in people. It's shifting away from investing in infrastructure that allows our society to continue to get bigger to investing in jobs that allow us to not so much increase our standard uh, of living as defined by our scale of consumption, but our quality of life, which is about jobs and work and how we do things together. So how much do we need to change in terms of job creation? What would those jobs be doing and where would they be across the UK? Well, we started with the, uh, the one million climate jobs. Uh, and, and then we looked at other areas as well. So we ended up breaking it down into five areas. Um, some people will talk about energy and buildings together, but we've got them as two separate sectors because they are so big in their own right. We've also focused on transport. We looked at waste and how that looks to, links to wider resource use. 
And finally, we've talked about farming and land use. Um, a lot of the, the, the plans which are more techno-centric and, and assume that we can deal with climate change from a technology point of view tend to focus on buildings and transport and stuff and not so much on the, on, on the change to the rural economy. I think it's quite important to think about how we need to not just plan for the houses, but plan for what's there already. Investment. Infrastructure, when you build it or you build a house, is locking in carbon for a long time. The average house has got about 50 tonnes of carbon to build it and put it in place before you put things inside. A car, maybe 10 or 15 years. So what we need to do is to make plans that stop putting large amounts of money in the wrong things and instead do things that are in the short term instead in terms of job creation. So what we've talked about is... So basic principles un underlying this process. First of all, um, we believe that to deal with uh, the transition to zero carbon, we need to plan. We can't let businesses, money, the markets deliver the solution. We need to make plans. And for that, we need to, need to set out what goes in the plans. How much resource do we need? What different infrastructure do we need? What different activities do we need to happen in that plan? That means we start by doing stuff. So it's about what we do now. It's about the, the effort to build wind turbines, the effort to insulate houses, um, the effort to provide different infrastructure. So instead of building uh, extra carriageways on the side of motorways, like where I live in, in Red Hill in Surrey, they want a uh, £5 million of government money to an to extra lane running in towards Croydon. What if instead we had... Um, doubled the frequency of buses and put, extended the, the cycle of superhighways from London all the way out into the countryside so that people are able to cycle now or electric cycle now the distances that people might have done in the past. So this is very much about jobs creating the different future. And as we go forward, um, more of the jobs are they going to be jobs within a sustainable community in the future. So um, we'll have more bus drivers in the future. We'll have more people maintaining our buildings to a higher standard. We'll probably have a lot more people working in the countryside. Um, a sustainable, organic, local agriculture with local supply chains will probably mean a more employment-intensive agriculture rather than a more uh, machinery and pesticide and herbicide-intensive agriculture, which is what we have at the moment. So there's a shift. So we're talking about two types of jobs here which overlap. There's the jobs that get us to a zero-carbon future, and then the different set of jobs we have when we arrive at that zero-carbon future. And for some sectors, it's very much, you know, build the wind turbines is the getting there, maintain the wind turbines and upgrade them is the future. For others, such as waste, as we slowly increase our reuse, our recycling, as we shift to more robust, long-lasting appliances, we'll have more and more and more jobs because we'll be shifting slowly from a, a wasteful society to a, a circular economy. And what that will leave us with is a different economy which is more local. Um, but we're not there yet. Um, th this is government statistics for carbon emissions from transport in Surrey from 2000 to 2015. If this was to be zero carbon within 10 years, which is our challenge, the shape of that graph would be more like this. It's not. Currently, we're not heading in the right direction. There's massive change in some sectors, such as transport, if we're going to create the movements necessary. Similarly, renewable electricity generation. Um, we currently have 64 megawatts at the end of 2016 in Surrey. Um, there is data published for every local authority by the government. Um, it's enlightened reading, if you're in this room. You know, we aren't where we need to be. So change needs to happen, and change needs to happen from the bottom up um, for two reasons. First, as I've said, because it needs to be small scale, and there'll be lots of solutions. And secondly, frankly, because it's not happening from the top down. So we need significant investment across all of these different areas, major transformation. It's not about a little bit of extra here and a little bit of extra there. It's a lot of change, both in the, in the transition... The shorter the transition time, the more people you need to be working to achieve that shift within that time scale. So the, the sooner we want to act. So if you look at 2025, which is the XR's deadline, then our estimates for what you do by 2030, you could pretty much double them. Because 2025 is only half away as 2030. 
Uh, and in the long term, similar, there's a large scale of jobs. So our estimates show that the number of jobs in the short term to get the transition and those in the long term are, are pretty similar. We need to do them in both areas. I'm going to hand over now to Peter to describe some of the detail of what happens within those different Hello. Um, so yeah, I'm going to take you through a bit of the modelling that we've done. Um, and possibly try and explain a little bit of these pamphlets that we've been, we've been we're trying to communicate this modelling the work we've done. So um, I'll take you through a little bit of the story of how we got here, and then I'll move you on to, to take you through a bit of the detail of how the modelling works. So, um, some of the jobs, that, the way we've done the jobs modelling is we've, took, we've used job metrics, and most of these are either um, on, they're all on things that happen, but some of those end up distributing the jobs by population. You know, the number of houses is, you know, has a relationship with the number of po where the people live in the country. Or some of them are based on um, resources. So, for instance, the number of wind turbines is affected by the amount of land area there is, the amount of wind resource there is, not by where the people live. So there are two different ways in which the jobs are split. Um, and the methodology is broadly like this. So uh, we've taken uh, government data from the Office of National Statistics and European data from the... Uh, from Eurostat. Um, all of these are based on cons basically conservative estimates because we've only modelled, we've modelled jobs lost as well as jobs gained. Um, and we've only modelled the primary sectors, so we've only modelled the physical things that are tied to a place. We haven't modelled any of the, uh, you know, the induced jobs or any of the sort of, well, where would you build the wind turbines? Well, it could be all sorts of places. That's, they're all extra jobs you'd have to add on on top of our estimates. Um, it's all based on proven technologies. We've, we have a very short amount of time. We have to do this with what we can already do. Um, and it's all, all the metrics are based on infrastructure change or activity change. If you want to have some buses operating, you need some people to drive them, some people to maintain them. So uh, a few years ago, we got some money, and we did a, sort of a small sort of case study for this based on the Isle of Wight. Uh, so that was our, the Isle of Wight work, and then we expanded that, and then for Sheffield City Region, which is obviously a much larger area with more connections and more complicated to model, and we also included uh, land and food, because that's a critical sector in terms of uh, showing the, the overall picture of the jobs change, particularly the regional distribution. Um, and then last December at the COP in Katowice, we published uh, this report, which is the, the culmination of our UK-wide modelling. So the latest set of modelling that we've published uh, is for every NUTS 3 region, which I will explain what means later, but basically it's somewhere between county and district, depending on where you are, uh, for the whole of the UK, um, uh, using data sets available from, as I said, to, to sort of automate that modelling process. Uh, so I'll... What do these jobs look like? So I'm going to take you through each of the sectors and broadly show you the sort of things that are included and the sort of things that aren't. So, uh, Jonathan's already laid out what the sectors are. But the last, last key one that's not actually on that list, but I'll come to at the end, is that we've included some jobs for what we call support jobs, which is, well, we have... A load of people, you know, who we have a load of people in the current population who are either in jobs that may be lost or who are currently unemployed, and we need to employ a load of people to do these jobs. We can't assume that these people are going to have the skills to do those jobs. So there's going to be training, there's going to be reskilling required, and that requires these people to do that reskilling. And there's also currently a lot of people aren't able to, you know, a lot of uh, uh, need support in accessing the workplace. So there's also some jobs in supporting those who are currently not able to participate in the workplace and participate in the workplace. Um, and, yeah, our total jobs estimates are there. It's about 900,000 jobs in the UK, not including any of the multipliers and induced jobs during the transition, uh, and about 450,000 long-term. So renewable energy, as expected, it includes all the installation of renewable energy, but it also includes the maintenance long-term. And these are the key ones. If you're going to... Because you're transitioning all the sectors and there's a lot of electrification, uh, we're going to have questions at the end, if that's all right. So we're going to, uh, at the end of, I'm going to explain what the, we've done, and then we're going to go through these documents, and there will be some group work, and then we're going to have a QA and a at the end, so there'll be an opportunity to answer some questions. Um, but we've included uh, uh, some jobs to uh, upgrade the grid, because if, if we shift, say, transport towards electric vehicles or heating towards heat pumps, that Puts, requires more electricity, so therefore we have to be able to move more electricity around the country. 
and the storage and demand management uh, uh, needed to ensure that we have the energy when we need it, because renewables are more, have more fluctuation in supply than conventional for, uh, electricity generation. Uh, so some broad overlines of the numbers. Don't worry about head up on the numbers in there, because the numbers are all in the summaries that we'll, I'll talk you through in a moment. So the built environments, this is the next sector, the retrofit sector. So uh, if you want to find out more about the sort of things this involves, then I strongly recommend going to the hub in the lunchtime session where the, the, the case study of Kirk Lees, is, they're going to talk you through what they did there. But it's based on that sort of street by street retrofit. The only way we can do enough houses in the time that we have is by, go, is by doing it in a coordinated way rather than an ad hoc way. Um, and there's, again, you need a load of maintenance. If you, you want houses to meet high energy standards long term, you're going to need to have more skills to maintain them to that level after. You know, it's no point installing solar panels if no one makes sure they're working and maintains them long term. Um, so, uh, ground source heat pumps, solar thermal, solar PV on you know, domestic roofs, uh, insulation and long term maintenance are the broad things covered in that sector. Better transport. So uh, it's, there's, there's two levels. There's uh, demand reduction in certain sorts of transport uh, that are, so for instance, flying. But another, there's also modal shifts, which are possibly the, the more significant ones. So uh, we've modelled uh, public transport. If you have more bus, more ra um, railway, more people travel by rail, then you need more people employed in the railways. And in uh, public transport, we've modelled the increase in additional bus drivers and bus maintenance, but we've also modelled in, uh, in, in terms of cars, well, because electric cars require less maintenance than fossil fuel cars, what's the change, you know, and, and potentially there's going to be less of them, how does that affect the number of people employed in the maintain, maintenance of vehicles? Um, so, uh, again, a summary of the, the trans, change in transport numbers, these are all UK national figures uh, they're breaking, broken down in summaries to different areas. Uh, and the national figures were all available in the report from uh, December. Uh, reuse and recycling. So uh, Jonathan's already have gone into a load of this, but it's about decon you know, deconstruction, which is more labour intensive than just demo de demolishing the whole lot. Um, but the, and we've compensated for all the jobs lost in landfill and incineration from waste that we don't throw away and don't burn. But the, the, the key point is that we only modelled this because the data is only available in terms of recycling. So we've modelled a shift to 90% recycling on the assumption that we wouldn't do 90% recycling, we'd do more reuse and more uh, reducing the need for waste in the first place, which there is evidence out there that suggests it's always more labour intensive and less energy intensive than recycling. So we, that makes our modelling numbers quite conservative in that sector. And the, so... Uh, I've just said that. Uh, so land management and forestry, uh, active management of woodland. A lot of woodland currently isn't managed for, for timber. Um, uh, a shift, so as part of this work, we propose a land use shift for the UK. It is very, it is not locally specific. We have not done any, would this be applicable in this area, local analysis, but taking um, some work done by Simon Fairley uh, to do with how whether Britain could feed itself, we've proposed the sort of scale of land use shifts that would be required at different levels. Um, some areas have to be moved around. It's not precise detail, but it gives you a feel for the amount of uh, change that's required, and then that allows you to then model the jobs from the different sorts of food production. One of the key things is that horticulture, which is quite labour-intensive, might need to happen closer to where people live, so therefore you might need to have more urban farms, you might need to have more small holdings, and so on. And so this is all based on the land use data for the UK, which is from the Coltrane land use it's satellite images they use to identify what the land use is. And we've taken all the data from that, the number of hectares of different land use, and used that to inform the model that we the modelling. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, there's a load of community and support jobs to facilitate the transition. Um, so just for a little bit of reference to come to the results, this is population density map of the UK. You know, London is really dense. There's various cities you can see. You know, uh, but and and more of the countryside has, has lower population. Obviously, if you then look at our results, 
uh, it's interesting how some of the, the darkest areas are actually not in the, you know, and, and not in the urban areas, and the urban areas are actually quite low in jobs, rel relative. This is all jobs per uh, number of people. So this is the, there will be jobs in all, all the different areas, but the jobs are sort of tend to de decentralise, de southeast focus the UK. All of our current economic focus is let's do everything in the southeast because that's where all the money is. But part of this transition might actually decentralise the UK. And that's just a zooming map of that. So this is not very hard to re read on there, but they, you hopefully have one in front of you. So we haven't published any new... Uh, the, the report still stands, so we published in December. That goes through all the methodology, goes through all of the, you know, the, the why it's important. Uh, but the actual jobs for your area are quite difficult to get at because they're in a massive appendix and a massive list and you have to go and look up random codes. So what we have done as, as our work this year is we've taken that, that modelling and we said, right, let's pull out the numbers for your local area. And we have printed, um, we've tried to print one of these for everyone who turned up today. Maybe not in quite works. We couldn't find the nuts regions for quite everyone. But they're all going to be published online um, for, where, for every local area. Um, and these summarise the results of the model, of, you know, that fit in with the modelling from last year for different areas. And they're all based on nuts codes, which is a European statistics thing, which I will very briefly explain because it is a little bit alien. Basically, it's, it's a, you know, we've done it because it allows it to be um, portable and it also, unlike the UK ones, they are, they're, they're, re they're tiered, so they're like a tree. So at the top you have the UK and then if you go to the next level down, they all put a letter on the end of it. So each of the regions, so northeast, for instance, is C, and all the, so it goes A, B, C, D, E, D, F, G, and they're all the different regions of the UK. So you can, what this allows you is to look at your jobs at your local area, and then go, well, hang on, if I go up to the next level, what's the, what does it look like there? And then go up to the next level, and then you can look at the UK national. So if you look on, if you've got one of these, and you look on, there's a first table, the first um, column in the first table tells you the nuts code that this bit of paper's for. Obviously, the area name is printed at the top, but the code is printed there. Um, and then you see we then put one on to go down to sort of county council level, and then we put another one on which goes down to district level. Um, so those, the, those are the results. Um, then four-page PDF, hopefully not too much to trawl through. It goes through, it has a table for each sector with a little bit of explanatory notes. Um, so it starts with uh, reuse and recycling, and then there's a transport table, and there's a retrofit table. There's a whole page on land use, and there's two tables. One is sort of the, 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 land, the agricultural land use change, and the other is the sort of, well, all the other bits of land. You know, is there going to be some more for, forestation? What are we going to do with all the current landfill sites? All that sort of stuff. Um, and then on the last, and then the job summary is actually on the, the, for agriculture is on the top of the last page. And then it goes to the renewable energy, and then the other job section is mentioned at the end, and obviously it links back to all the, the explanatory me methodology, which is in the um, the report we published in December. So a little bit of a whistle stop tour, which I'm sure you all haven't followed. I will take that as a, a definite. Um, so what we're going to do now um, is we're going to have if you. Have a look at, if you've got one of these, have a look at one. If you haven't got one, we will give out the rest of the ones that might not be for your personal area, but they give you an example to look at. Um, and then have a little bit of a look. See, see if you can work out what it means. F start producing a list of questions. And then we're going to talk in pairs and see if you can answer each other's questions. And then we're going to slowly build up and we'll do some Q&A at the end so that hopefully by the time you leave this room, this will make at least some vague sense. That's our aim, OK? So uh, Jonathan's just coming around. Um, have a little look at one if you've got one, and when you think you've got some questions, find someone else and see if they know the answers to them. And then the best questions we'll save for the yes. Q and A. Okay, I'm hearing from down the front that we haven't entirely made sense of it, so I think this is the chance where it's a good chance to actually ask the authors to come back to this. So yes, you get me again in the chair, but I'm not going to say very much. I'm just here to chair and take questions. So would anyone like to address the question to either of the authors of the, the study? We're starting from here, down, right down the left. Hi. Um, it's a microphone, if you just wait for the microphone to come, just so everyone Thank can you. hear. Hi, uh, Andrew Shadrake from uh, Action on Climate in Teambridge, so that's South Devon. I'm particularly interested in how the potential for each nuts region has been arrived at. Is it a 
Is it a fraction of the UK, or does it take account of, for, for example, in South Devon we've got Dartmoor with particular issues? So I'll try and answer that, and the answer is it's not quite the same for all sectors. So some sectors are, and the methodology report explains all this in detail, but I didn't want to bore you for hours, but uh, some sectors are measured, measured, modelled at NUTS 3, so uh, land use, every NUTS 3 region does its own modelling, and then all the other levels are just adding up the ones below. Transport is all done at NUTS 2, so that's sort of county level-ish, um, and then is scaled down by population to NUTS 3, so is a little bit more, you know, uh, NUTS 3 is not a little bit less granular. Um, waste is done at the level in which the waste statistics are available, which I think is NUTS 3, but I'd have to check the methodology report. Uh, uh, what have we got? And renewable energy, so it's a bit, you know, things like offshore wind, are, the number just doesn't appear at any of the levels below, whereas the, it does appear at the national level because we haven't, there is an interesting exercise to do to go, well, where would the offshore wind jobs if we built that much be? But we haven't done that exercise, that would be further work, which we would be very interested if someone was going to do. Um, then, but then some of the other ones, so retrofit of buildings is done uh, at the NUTS 3 level because that's we have the number of buildings in each area and we've made us we've made we haven't there are certain bits of regional variety we haven't taken account for so all the stuff that's built into the land use statistics for the UK i.e. Dartmoor has a huge amount you know less you know complex cultivation i.e. you know fruit and veg production than most other than say Kent and therefore, that would be in the land use statistics, and therefore, you would expect the, the model to reflect that. Whereas, the fact that Kirkley's has, say, done a load of retrofit and other places haven't, that's not taken into account. That's all just based on that percentage retrofit average across the country. So, there is certain information that just isn't available at that level of granularity. So, therefore, we've just sort of assumed a national trend and then worked out how that would apply in different areas. I just, I just had one very small thing, which is, uh, this is a very short piece of paper with some numbers on. Um, there is a, a methodology report for the, for the UK, which is referenced here. And I think there's a couple of copies up there. It's the document standing up in, in the green. And that's got a, uh, a flow chart which shows how all of the job metrics fit together for the estimates we've currently done. You will therefore be able to see and interrogate w what the current numbers represent. Um, but a word of caution, that there are only jobs estimates for things that we had estimates for job intensity of. So that, that means that, they're, they're, if anything, these job numbers are going to be a lot bigger in many cases in, in reality. Um, and, and, and there are basically three sorts of jobs which I think you could have from, from going zero carbon. The first are jobs created in a local area, very much connected to the people and the land that is in that place, and that's what we've done. The second are... And we've assumed that they are generally extra jobs or less jobs, depending on what's happening, and, and, and that's what this work focuses on. There's a second set of jobs, which you could call just transition, which is um, making more wind turbine blades, um, making more electric buses, making less cars. So we've roughly assumed that um, that's a challenge for someone else. Um, there, there is a, there's another workshop next door called Just Transition, um, the challenge of shifting from car industry jobs to wind turbine jobs, accepting that expertise and skills are located in certain areas, is, is very much a trade union and government scale challenge rather than something that's currently being looked at by local authorities. So that's left out of here. And the other set of jobs which we really haven't included is the notion that as you localise your economy um, and you have more jobs in rural areas and more in villages, for example... Maybe that local pub that shut five years ago, or that local shop that shut, or that high street that's half empty, might be repopulated. Um, there might be more caring in the community. There might be um, more community spirit, uh, and, and we need to think about how the jobs, which we focused on, are very much environmental jobs. There's also quite a, a lot of, if you like, society jobs, about bringing people, people together to making sure that the results of this are fair and equitable. Um, again, that's work that's been done by other people, so we haven't dared to go there. So this is mainly jobs which are related to local places, and we've made those job estimates as local as possible based on stats which are published mainly by the government. One quick point. All of our jobs metrics we used are published in the main report. If anyone knows of any extra ones, please share. You know, we're trying to build up a repository of labour intensities. OK, another question. I'm going to go to a different table just to share it round. Yep. Uh, the microphone's coming behind you. Yep. 
this one, the, the red picture. Hi, right, Simon Pickering. Um, so you, it's only the direct jobs, because somebody who works in, in industry, in the renewable industry, I would suspect a lot of the jobs that will occur in, in the transition may be in the sales teams, the marketing teams, the user experience, and the IT associated with marketing those businesses, um, not the actual manufacturer. There's only, there's only one manufacturer of turbines in the UK. There's two blade factories and one manufacturer of turbines. They're all, off, they're all on continental at the moment. So, um, but there's a hell of a lot of people involved in trying to get planning permission for wind turbines, doing the finances for them. Um, and it, so there's a whole other side of the economy that um, I, I get where it's really interesting stuff. I have to say, it's brilliant stuff. But there's an absolutely fascinating side to the other thing. And I just compared it to the employment figures in Gloucestershire and the sectors. And it is so, so different. Because you're saying that there'll be a massive increase in agriculture. And according to the, our local LEP, there's going to be an 18% decrease in agriculture over the next 25 We might years. be making different assumptions. Yeah, that. I mean, it's really <laughs> intriguing. Um, so where do all the service and background jobs fit in? So, so, so I, I would say that one thing we haven't done is created our own job metrics. We've looked at the job metrics that are out there already. Uh, we've collated those job metrics, and we've effectively created a marriage of convenience between those metrics, taken back to find out where they were originally researched and published and then we've compared that to the ONS stats for local areas to, to link the two together. Um, what we've tried to avoid is using metrics where they say five jobs are created in renewable en energy, which will generate a total of 15 jobs in your local area. Because if you did that for three sectors of the local area, all of a sudden you've created an awful lot of extra jobs, which we haven't just accounted for. So this is the, the jobs created in doing the wind turbine or doing the solar panel in the local area, rather than making it in the factory, and not saying that, OK, that extra person employed in the local area will then put more money into the local area, which will create a stronger economy, which will have a, a greater job benefit. We've just looked at the direct jobs, but because we wanted to make sure we didn't risk overcounting. That last counting. point is true, but we just haven't tried to quantify it. <laughs> you know, we yeah. just, because you end up double counting if you, yeah, 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 you know. Yeah. Yeah. OK, okay. Qu question at the back there. I'm just aware of the gender balance of questions, which I'd like to try and balance up a little if I can at some stage. Yep. John Webb, uh, UK Without Incineration Network and Hearts Without Waste. Just to avoid misunderstanding, are the modelled results net of jobs that will be replaced in, a, in an area? So in, in the area of waste, it includes a reduction in the jobs of incineration and the jobs of landfill yep. and the increase in jobs of reuse and recycling. In the area of energy, it's the increase in renewable energy jobs and the reduction of running power stations. But I don't think we've then gone to the extent of, of uh, re removing jobs in coal mining and, and so forth. So the question yeah. is, how far back do you go? So in terms of the direct in location jobs, so we've, we've tried to remove jobs for fossil fuel power stations, incineration and landfill, and some other and, things. And some maintenance of cars that are, you know, fossil fuel cars and a few other things that are not going to happen. But, and we, as was pointed out earlier, we haven't done any of the service or support stuff or, in, or any of the secondary industry stuff, which will obviously, what we're proposing, will induce massive changes in that, and that is where we would recommend you to go to the Just Transition, you know, look at the Just Transition stuff, because that is another challenge. Am I right in thinking that the modelling results are mm, produced with limited resources from existing data, as you've said? Yeah. Therefore, one shouldn't get obsessive about them. Yeah. They're a starting point for, they're in indicative. They're, they're, yeah. they're to work out, play out in each area. So you could think about this as not so much like a job estimate, but a job potential. So what we want to basically say is, if you if you look at your area and it says there is roughly a thousand jobs and 500 is doing this and 200 is doing that and 100 is doing that, you can and then you imagine right, okay, my local council only has 300 staff, then you can see the level of effort that's going to need, be needed to go through a zero carbon transition in your area is two times as many people in total as the whole employers of your local council. 
And that's the scale of challenge that needs to be written into your council's zero carbon plan. So it's not about you know, getting one sustainability officer and putting a little bit of small grants out to the community. It's hundreds of jobs or thousands of jobs. And that's really the message we want to get out. We could have done it with money. The problem with doing a report with money is it very quickly gets out of date. Um, we think that doing it with jobs is, is more helpful because the, hopefully the report will still be useful in a number of years' time. And people won't say, oh, yeah, but that was produced in 2000, whatever. So I hope that more than anything else, it, it fits within the, the climate emergency plan challenge. It, this is a, giving an indication as to how big your plan needs to be in different areas if it's going to really be zero carbon. OK, turn here to the crew. Fran? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, John Taylor here. Um, yeah, really um, important and timely piece of research. Um, I work for a team called the Greater South East Energy Hub, and we're um, funded by BASE, the Government's Energy, Industry and Skills Department, to work with LEPs and local authorities to quantify and accelerate the delivery of local energy um, projects across um, the southeast of England. Um, so, yeah, I very much see, having worked with LEPs now, that they've just got a complete blind spot for this sector mm. and so there's a really important role of translating all this green jobs potential into language that they understand which is what you're doing here which is yeah. great um, yeah so they're very aware of the opportunity around nuclear and offshore wind but um, yeah just quantify yeah you've got the picked it up there yeah so in the south coast from Hampshire to Essex the LEPs combined and made a local energy strategy which quantified the amount of investment needed in jobs and productivity to keep in line with the government's carbon budgets and it's something like 15 billion pounds of investment over the next 10 years and there's some job multiplier metrics in there as well um, I'll just say the language they really want to know um, is productivity um, how um, and gross value added how do you um, yeah, boost those metrics, but I think they need to be coupled with carbon intensity as well. So, how do you monitor the carbon intensity of gross value added and productivity? So I'll give you a couple of comments back. Firstly, um, we were aware a couple of years ago that the government intended every one of the 42 local enterprise partnerships in the UK to produce local energy strategies, and that was one of our initiatives for kicking off this research and why we chose the, she the Sheffield City region as a focus for research because that piece of work, that report is focused on one LEP area, and when we produced that work, we worked with um, the Zero Carbon Britain team of Centre for Alternative Technology, and we spent a weekend with Zero Carbon Yorkshire um, discussing and working out what we thought that Sheffield plan might be. So the intention was to write uh, a report which would help um, give an idea of the scale of effort for a LEP area. Uh, the South East Region report of 15 billion if you scale that up to the UK, um, that ends up in the sort of hundreds of billions of pounds. Um, the Green Party and the government, with different timescales, estimate we need more like a trillion. So it feels like the level of ambition for these strategies is maybe an order of magnitude too small to zero, deliver zero carbon. So one of the key messages in our report is think about the scale of the challenge against what's already written, and the, dist and the difference, where does the difference lie? We don't think the difference lies in building more roads, or more automation of rural countryside, or, or zero carbon for even more houses to be built. We think the, the extra ambition needs to be in things like um, transitioning to a zero transport system, and a zero waste system, and, and, and. So it, we really wanted to set out the things that distinguish this sort of report from from you know, the work um, that really needs to be done. And, and I hope that, that, that by focusing on jobs, we, we haven't got all the answers, clearly. We, we don't have economists in our team, and we don't have a large budget to do economic analysis. But hopefully, this is the start of a 10 for people who do that have those skills to, to try and help us develop these arguments. And maybe the LEP funding might transition away from vast amounts of money for bypasses around towns and cities um, to maybe some kind of government energy deal so we get enough money for renewable energy where it's needed across the UK. Okay, I'm potentially allowing space for one more question. I really would like to get a question from a woman. Yep. Um, I noticed that, so basically I help run a community farm 
And I've noticed that uh, hectares currently under fruit and vegetables for my area is zero. And do you think that's because we're like such a grassroots organisation that we're just going under the radar? So that is based. That number is based on the com number of of classification in that you, you satellite imaging thing. So yes, if you're smaller than a certain area, the satellite probably missed you. Okay. Um, and there's probably lots of errors in that satellite data as well. Um, so and and that also only has certain categories. So we've we've assumed that horticulture is basically fruit trees and orchards, complex cultivation, which we're not in, you know it's very how they define that is a bit arbitrary, but presumably greenhouses and things and irrigated farmland. If you're not really quite any of those, and you're sort of you look like an allot, allot, allotment or mm. you know yes, and but this is a thing of scale. If you you know if you've got zero in that and you need to be at so many hectares, then although I'm sure the work you're doing is great, but that's the amount of scaling up that's required. Yeah. Okay, okay, and on, yeah. on that um, point, I'm just going to add a personal point here, which is not directly on the subject of jobs, but um, a lot of people don't know the World Health Organization says the world needs to grow twice as much fruit and vegetables as it grows now to meet a basically healthy diet, and that's the five a day of fruit and veg that everyone's heard of. The nutritionists actually say we need ten a day fruit and veg, um, so that's quadruple. And if we assume you know, the UK roughly imports about 50% of its fruit and vegetables, uh, so we're now up to an eight-time scaling up of what you're doing and much more to get to a healthy diet, the basic requirement of something the economy should be supplying. OK, I'll stop abusing my chair's pri privilege for my favourite thing at this point and <laughs> hand back to Jonathan, who's just got a few final comments to finish off this session. Last one, one more. That was just a, a final, final imagine. Just imagine the scale of the challenge. Effectively, what we've done here is, is focused on a million jobs. What if there is another million in just transition? And what if there is a further million in creating more resilient local communities? Um, the New Economics Foundation have an LM3 model, which says for every one job created in a local area, there is a, a three jobs worth of benefit. So, what if the second job is like the just transition job? And why that might be local? Because rather than having large manufacturing bases and, and like this sort of a one horse town where the whole town is there making cars or another whole town is there maybe in, in India or China these days making paper clips or, uh, <laughs> or, or something. You know, every town is required not to be specialist in one thing. You know, the law of comparative advantage which drives globalization and ever greater you know, shipping and aviation freight distances. But we have a, uh, a system where, effectively, we have much more things happening in every places. And, and every, every enterprise links in with those other enterprises locally. We upskill ourselves. So maybe every person has one job with reduced hours, um, talking about, you know, a basic income. But a second job where they might be a musician, or they might work in a community farm, or they might run a community apple press. So... These jobs may not necessarily be paid jobs. It might be the, the current economy reduces in scale, but the amount of work or the, you know, the amount of transition work that needs to be done, whether it's by retired people in their spare time, by people of all ages um, through having a day a week to do community stuff. You know, we used to have the idea of a, a Sabbath, um, uh, a holy day, uh, a holy day when you do stuff in your community, you serve others. And in our, in our culture, we've turned holy day into holiday, where you run away and you don't do anything in your local community at all for that time. Or no, go shopping. We, we go shopping. <laughs> and, and, we, and we fly. You know, what if rather than those consumer days, we turn those into community days? So it may be that our current economics doesn't allow those three million you know, man years person years, every single year of work to be paid. But it still needs to be done. So how do we maybe become more activists in our, in our approach to life and, and put more investment into that? Um, how does that make economics different in the UK? Currently we have economics which is linked to a global economic system. What if the creation of local climate jobs will also localise the economy? What, is, what if, as we've shown in our modelling, more of these jobs will be created in small villages and small towns and across rural areas across the UK. We looked at the Isle of Wight. 
The Isle of Wight has got the biggest recruiting uh, nationally, one of the biggest recruiting nationally areas for the army. And it's also got one of the highest areas of mental health because of the results of people returning from the army. It's got a low skill base because the younger generation leave the island because there's no university on the island, engage with Portsmouth, Southampton or further away and don't come back. It's got an ageing population rather than working population. It's not in a strong position to create that transition. And I think that's probably reflected in many rural and small village communities across the UK. Younger people tend to work in cities and in London, and then maybe at my age or slightly earlier or slightly later in life, decide to have children and return back maybe to, to those family places. But what if more of the, the energy and enthusiasm and work of every generation of our economy was in the rural areas. We're not going to transition to a zero carbon Britain if the areas like the rural and the towns and the villages are starved of people of working age to cause that transition. So we need to relocalise the UK. That would mean rebalancing the UK. That would mean people living in what are currently empty homes in villages in Lancashire rather than building ever more houses around London, making the UK economy more and more misbalanced. It would mean not this forced separation that either you work in an office because you've been to a university or you work in manual or semi-skilled employment because perhaps you didn't. But there might be more, less blue jobs and white collar jobs, but more green jobs where we're required to balance that manual work with the creativity and the intelligence to do something more and different. Maybe the word entrepreneur won't be that, you know, it's a, a word which almost seems to come from those people who are afford enough um, to be in a social situation to have money to create an entrepreneur and enterprise. But the word entrepreneur might be the idea that we can create change with insufficient time, insufficient money, and insufficient people to do what's required. And we can entrepreneur a future by creating more jobs across the UK in places where maybe people don't even live currently in the numbers needed to create that better use of land, the renewable energy, the farming and so forth, to create a change. So this, this is quite radical. It's, it's, not, it, <laughs> it's, it's not just yeah, saying that within your local authority area you need to change what you do to make yourself zero carbon, but there are places across the UK... Um, rural areas which effectively need to do even more work because London can't be zero carbon. London needs a rural area around it. So if you want to, to live in London and you say you want your London borough to be zero carbon, how many people in Stroud or in you know, Gloucestershire, Wider or in Mid Wales you know, need to be there instead to allow London you know, London's food supply, London's energy supply to be, to, to, to be working properly. So, you know, this, this is huge, absolutely huge. And I hope that the tools of this report help you to be able to think through and express. So you don't have to be an economist to talk about jobs. Um, but, it, but if you do talk about jobs, maybe you can be a green economist. Thank you.